Off and other planet entertainment. I'm on Promoter 101. This is episode 174 of the Promoter 101 podcast. Joining me right now, Jake Leighton Pope of the great dynasty of the Leighton Pope family. Welcome back to the podcast. I know I should be getting paid for this. This is like third time now. Anyway, this is a special Promoter 101. Dan here sits down for one on one interview with Emporium Presents partner and co founder Jason Zink. Plus, we turn the tables on APA's Steve Ferguson. So here we go Promoter 101, episode. 174. This is Dave Shapiro, Mike Mills, Sam Hunt, Joey Scolari, Rich Best, Tim Sweetwood, Andy Levitt, Sarah Beasley, Jared Poff, Bobby Clay, John Phillips, Greg Palmleaf, Harvey Cohen, Rich Schaefer, this is Eric Mayers, and I am live on Promoter 101. So the word's kind of getting out, Jake. The podcast is coming to an end fast, but you can join us in person for the final interview in Nashville, Tennessee at the IEBA conference. I know it's sad days, Dan, and uh, obviously it's too expensive to keep flying over to the UK to do these. But yes, the final interview and live podcast recording from IEBA as a keynote session. It's taking place on October 27th to 29th at the JW Marriott in Nashville. We look forward to wrapping this up with so many of our friends in attendance. I may even come myself. It will be a very special podcast. We're really working on to ensure that it's our best one ever. If there's something you want to share with us, simply email us at steiny at promoter101.net. We're happy to respond to you day or night. Operators are standing by. Or we could maybe bring it into the future and go for a bit of social media. You can get us on all of them. Twitter. Luke is on W. Luke Pierce. Dan's at, at the Jew. And the show is at Promoter 101. What's yours? I'm at Jake LP. We are on Instagram. The show is Steiny Promoter 101. Luke is W. Luke Pierce, and I'm Dan Presents. You can also check everything out on Facebook. Same thing on Tumblr. Same thing on LinkedIn. And of course, you can go to the World Wide Web. It's Promoter101.com. Hi there. This is Jody Goodman from Live Nation, San Francisco, Northern California. And I am on Promoter 101 with Steiny in the house. Let's celebrate some birthdays of the week, 6th to 11th of August. Tuesday, 8, 6, Josh Knight and Brian Traeger. Wednesday, 8, 7, Dave Wells. 8, 8, that's Thursday. Randy Ferbaker, Harry Tyler, better known as Fat Harry, and Ollie Jennings. Friday, 9th, always a good time to have a birthday for Katie Brogan, Stephen Shaw, Kath Buckle, and Matt Girding. Saturday, 8, 10, Laurie Kirby and Randy Hawkins. Sunday, hangover day. Lauren Gruckel, Jimmy Koplick, Rob Chalice, my good friend, Jake Babels, and Brett Morrison. Happy birthday. And 812, Greg Bogart. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, all you 101ers. Have a good time. This is Brian Traeger from Live Nation, and this is Promoter 101. Promoter 101 Flashbacks. Episode 65. Dan Berkowitz. If you think about the jam band scene, I think about Mike Luba, who, you know, started with Madison House and the String Cheese incident, and then went on to produce one of the most successful family entertainment tours of all time with Yo Gabba Gabba. And Jonathan Shank, who managed Particle and man also managed the Disco Biscuits for about an hour and a half. I kid, it was it was about a, I think a year and a half. But um, then Jonathan Shank went on to produce the Fresh Beat Band and Peppa Pig, Imagination Movers, right? Ah, the Movers. Um, so oddly enough, my foray into family entertainment, and now we're known as within the family entertainment circle, we are the experiential providers, and it is one hundred percent in part to relationships that were built fifteen twenty years ago in the jam band scene. Yeah, it's funny. It's like we're doing Peppa Pig show together in Albuquerque. And I remember the note from the venue. Do you, we want to trust a third tier ticketing company for their VIP expense? You really want that on your contract? I remember copying you in. It was just like, I think I know where they live. You're like, actually, they're fourth tier. Let me handle this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Think yeah, I mean, I and think we're good. You know, that kind of brings up a sensitive yet topical point of conversation is the relationship that we have with promoters. You know, there's local promoters, there's national promoters, and we're not necessarily risk takers on shows. And we're an ancillary business. And for all of those at home, CID Entertainment is the side of our business that provides VIP tickets and travel packages for concerts and festivals. So if we're on a tour, let's say a Peppa Pig tour. Now, Peppa Pig, the pig is a beast, so she's doing great. But if we're on a tour, or if it's going okay, but the VIP is going well, and then the promoter might want to shave certain expenses and might, you know, would probably rather the VIP be in house. We understand that there's a unique relationship that we have with promoters. So we have to, we're not just servicing the fans. The fans are our number one priority, but we need to be really, really easy to work with for the bands because otherwise they just wouldn't have us out on the road. And we need to be equally easy to work with and supplementary to the venue. We never want to cost you money. We want to help pay for any expenses that we're incurring. Dare I say we might overpay in certain situations where we're paying for certain catering or staff costs or, or security costs. We're not trying to beat up any venues. We're trying to be partners with the venues. Like We want to leave a lasting good impression when we do Peppa Pig in Albuquerque. We don't want the people coming back to the venue saying that was a terrible experience because at the end of the day, we're going to leave Albuquerque. The building isn't. The building's going to be there the next time. So we understand that we need to do a really, really, really good job to stay in the good graces with the venues and the promoters that we work with. This is Emma Banks. I work at Creative Artists Agency, and this is Promoter 101. It's time to turn the tables. Up next, turn the tables with APA Steve Ferguson. Steve Ferguson, after sitting here and me asking you questions, you get to turn the tables on me. What's on your mind? How much money have you spent on uh, faces and names? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, but I bet Jason Zink knows how much money I've spent at faces and names. But you should ask him one day. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's better not to know. Just to use those points to fly to London to see Stone Roses. Okay. But I, I know it was enough points to make it uh, an international trip. God bless Amex. <laughs> Steve will be back this Thursday for a full interview on Promoter 101. This is Adam Stroll with Cervantes and AEG Denver, and you're listening to Promoter 101. It's time for the Promoter 101 Badass of the Week, which is incredibly hard to say if you're an Englishman because badass is an American word. We like all the words. You know, English was invented in America. Did you know that? I know, and Donald Trump can spell. Okay, this week's Badass of the Week goes out to Metallica's own Mark Ryder, the backbone of the Bay Area rock band, making him this week's Promoter 101 Badass of the Week. Hard to argue with that, for sure. I mean, anyone who's done anything for Metallica and those guys earns Badass of the Week. Congrats, Mark Ryder. Fresh news, boat shoes, and interviews. Only on Promoter 101. We've got a special feature interview with Jason Zink. We had pre-recorded that interview a couple weeks ago. And since then, some of you may have heard Jason had had a run-in with a copperhead snake on his travels. He's a survivor. He's doing okay. We've got him here on the podcast as an update before we run that interview. So we can hear the story from the man himself. Jason, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks much. I appreciate it. I wish I was uh, talking to you about something else. But yeah, I got bitten by a copperhead. Uh, If you ever wondered who the hell gets bitten by a copperhead, the answer is me, apparently. So yeah, I was going to Asheville, North Carolina for a Gordon Lightfoot show that we had, and it got postponed the day before because he had a leg injury. So I decided to go to Brevard, the Brevard Music Center, which I had never been to. It's about 40 minutes outside of Asheville. So I went down, parked the car, was walking to the venue, and I'm walking on the asphalt road there and got bitten by a snake. I turned around and I see it, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. And it was, uh, the pain was pretty immediate. So I went back to get a good look at the snake because I wanted to you know, be able to tell people what it was so they knew what to give me. And that thing didn't slither away or anything. It just stared at me. So I hopped up about a quarter mile the rest of the way to the venue and which is, you know, not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be calm and not get the, get it into your, <laughs> the venom into your system. Flag somebody down and got a ride to the hospital where I spent the night. Okay, so were you just in like shock that you were able to walk or does it not hurt immediately when you get bit? It hurts intensely immediately, but there was nobody else around. I got there like basically right at showtime. So there had been like 15, 1800 people that had just walked along this road. So the odds of this 
happening are astronomical, like it shouldn't have happened. But got up there and it hurt intensely all the way up there and really intensely after that. So you get to the hospital and they're, you know, they're marking uh, on my skin uh, every 30 minutes or so how far up the venom has traveled up my leg. And so, yeah, it ended up swelling from basically my toe up through my hip. We are 17 days after this now and I still can't walk. <laughs> so it seems like in the next week and a half I might be able to walk. So hopefully that's coming because uh, honestly the initial pain was uh, was pretty intense. So I spent a few days in Asheville, a few days uh, I got a ride to uh, Nashville and then I got home uh, this past weekend. You're back in Colorado, you're working Working, you're at your desk and well, you're recouping slowly. You're on the men and you're good. You're going to be a snake bite survivor when it's all said and done. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully this doesn't fall off in the meantime. But yeah, I'm still <laughs> trying to uh, get in to see a doctor out here that no one has <laughs> copperhead bite experience, I've discovered. So it's, it's a little bit of an odd thing. But yeah, I didn't, didn't get uh, anti-venom. I guess they don't give that to that many people. The cost wasn't a discussion, but came to find out later, like people who get anti-venom shots uh, later on get bills for like 30, 40 grand. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty nuts, but it wasn't life-threatening for me. So they uh, they decided not to give it to me, but yeah, it stopped at my leg. But yeah, if they said it, you know, if it had gone, gone further and gotten to my kidneys, it would have been uh, some serious trouble. I've heard in my research over the last couple of weeks, as I've learned more about snake bites than I've ever paid attention to them before, <laughs> that pregnancy and passing a stone both fall short of actually being bit by a copperhead snake. It seems like that might be realistic to you. Not that you've ever given birth personally. No, no. I, of experiences that I have had in my life, I, I, I uh, would compare it to getting kicked in the nuts. <laughs> there you go. Well, Jason, so glad you survived because obviously that would have affected my workload quite a bit. And you know, <laughs> I enjoy you being around on a personal note. We're going to go ahead and roll that interview that we've got with you. But it's good to know that you're going to live and a snake survivor. So you got the story to boot. Ta-da, I win. Sort of. Thanks. In our feature interview this week, Dan sits down for one on one interview with Emporium Presents partner and co founder Jason Zink. There's just no way of saying this without it being awkward. We're interviewing Jason Zink today of Emporium Presents. Dan, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. There's just no way that this can be treated as a normal interview. It's just we've known each other way too long. But the requests to have you on the podcast over the last two and a half years have been numerous, and we just got to do it. So what the fuck? Podcast is the perfect format, but our facial expressions on uh, the question and answer would really explain a whole lot more than this, I think. <laughs> just as most of it won't be audible. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so it's important to note that we haven't started drinking yet. This is completely a sober session. I can hear the beer chilling in the background, though. Okay, so let's go back <laughs> and let's talk about you and how you found your way to the music industry back in the young Cincinnati days of Jason Zink and entertainment. <laughs> Graduated high school on a Friday. On a Monday, it was my first day working for a Local 5 in Cincinnati. Stagehand union at the Cincinnati Opera. Did lighting. And so the first thing I was kind of trained on was running spotlights. And so... When you're doing that for the opera, it's super slow and take it easy and not a lot of fast movements. So learned how to kind of do that and learned, uh, learned the technical end uh, working at Music Hall there and doing other gigs around Cincinnati for the union. So you move into theater and normally theater kids like kids that came up in the choir or the drama side would do that. But you were an athlete in high school. Yeah, never in theater. Probably one of the few people that has never played an instrument in his life. Right, but you played baseball and trying to take you to the baseball story and the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Just do that story since like, clearly that's not going to come up any other way. Nope, fair I enough. love that story. <laughs> yeah, so played sports in high school. So, you know, football, baseball, that kind of thing. Baseball, well, freshman year, I, I did baseball the first half of the season and then I got kicked off the team for ordering a pizza on the bench. It was, you know, it was an afternoon. I was hungry. And you saw the little uh, snappy tomato pizza car coming all the way around the field. Very Spicoli-esque. Yeah. Well, you know, had, in the old days, had the big sign on the top. And so the team knew that I ordered it. And so everybody was cracking up watching it come around the field. <laughs> And, you know, it came and everybody had a piece of pizza and everybody was having a good time. The coach actually didn't realize we did a good job when he was out coaching third base of getting it out then. And at the end of the show, actually, one of the end of the <laughs> game, uh, one of the parents actually went up 
up and told on us. I didn't give anybody else up, but I was the one that took the fall for that one. So I was known as the pizza man and I ran, uh, I ran track for the rest of the year. But yeah, the other three years of high school, I was known as the pizza man on the baseball team. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, is there anywhere in the rule books that said you couldn't order for lunch or bring a snack? It was never discussed. I would like to think well, that the tie I, goes to the runner then. I would agree. And that's an appropriate analogy for this. But no, no, they weren't. They weren't looking at it that way. All right. Love that. Story. So back to, uh, yeah, get called down to uh, Riverfront Coliseum to do a public enemy show. And I'm going to be, be running a trust spot for that. So uh, a little more excitement than doing the opera. A little different than the opera. You know, pre-show rundown with the lighting designer. He says, all right, spot three. I hope you're an experienced spot because Flavor Flav is your man tonight. And I was like, oh, shit. So I'm spot three. And so I'm climbing up there, you know, getting into the show. He starts calling out, you know, what's going to happen. And in the first song, getting the call to fade out in a five count. And as I'm doing that, I'm pulling the dowser, what allows more or less light in. And it falls off. It falls down onto the stage. And I can no longer fade in or out anymore. Just on or off. Right. Just on or off. So And as bright as can possibly be then. Yeah. So uh, I'm on headset. The headset's working, but I can't talk. The mouthpiece is broken. So he's yelling at me most of the show because every time we have to fade out, I just bump out. And then to come back in, you have to come back in in yellow in a three count. Well, when I bump it back in, this particular light is purple until it warms up in about 20 or 30 seconds. So every time I come back in, I'm in the wrong color. It's too fast. And basically, the guy's screaming at me the entire show. And I was like, man, what a fun life this would be. I really need more of this. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Life is purple. (laughs) You found your way into the music industry via your brother's help, right? Yeah. Well, it's my older brother was, yeah, worked for, for Local 5. And we kind of got into that because the uh, the business agent for Local 5 uh, lived in the neighborhood. So we kind of knew him from that. And so brother's uh, six years older. And yeah, so you're he, saying with the union, it's not how you get in, it's who you know? <laughs> who you know is how you get in. Absolutely. Right, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, a little bit of that. And, you know, they, they, you know, there's definitely a little bit more of a trust thing there with they know you, they know you're going to show up and work hard and do all that kind of stuff. So great, you know, hardworking group of guys, you know, unions can be different from city to city, but the Cincinnati one in particular, I learned quite a bit from and really good group of folks to take their stuff pretty seriously. Okay. So how do you transfer from running a spot op during Flavor Flav's concert in the arena to becoming a concert promoter? How did that jump happen? Yeah. So I was going to school at Miami University. Of Ohio. In Ohio. Yeah, exactly. That's not where they normally keep Miami, by the way. So the first thing you learned at college? The first thing I learned at college was Miami was university before Florida was a state. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. There you go. So uh, I've got that going for me, which is nice. One of those random, like, you know, what are you going to do with your life sessions in college? You remember sitting down and it's like, you know, what do you enjoy doing? What are your passions? All this kind of stuff. And so I'm kind of filling this, this little, you know, what are you going to do with your life sheet? And it kind of led me to, oh, maybe I could do something in concert. So that was the first time I was like, oh, maybe this is a career. So I applied to the Miami University Concert Board and ended up getting on that and then being the production chair and then the booking chair. So that was a really great experience for a couple of reasons. One, the person who sort of oversaw the program from afar was Mother Hubbard. So Barbara. Mother Hubbard was my original mentor in the business there. So we did the Allman Brothers with her and Ray Charles and all sorts of random stuff we did up there. But she was one that, you know, while it was mostly her money, was letting the students really make mistakes and do the work. You know, it wasn't just, you know, the students going around putting up posters. Uh, we were actually doing the work. Uh, and she was, you know, being helpful. What an amazing woman. And, you know, there's a lot of people that owe their careers to Barbara. And she's a great lady. How often did she come up? She would just come up for the shows pretty much. So a couple times a year? Yeah, a couple times a year. We got her the nice hotel on campus and a bottle of Jack Daniels, which we thought was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> But she come up with that, and we just most of that was by phone. My co-chair, I think my junior year, went down and did an internship with her for the summer. Well, which was a good internship until I think he fell off a horse and broke his arm. But but other than that, it was a good internship. But had she overseen the horse, that never would have happened. <laughs> exactly. He went rogue on that one. <laughs> so you're on the concert side, you're in school. How does that move into actually having a career outside of that? Yeah, a place that I worked in the summers through the union was Riverbend in Cincinnati. And so, was that Nederlander at the time? It was Nederlander at the time, exactly. It was under Harry Nederlander's auspices from Detroit. So I was uh, went down and interviewed with, with Mike Smith, who was the general manager there at the time. 
time. He's still down there. And yeah, I got an internship there for the summer. I was probably 20, kind of split my time between marketing and production. So I started out marketing a lot of the shows and then kind of moved into production when the season started and definitely was, you know, treading on some of my stagehand knowledge, but actually advancing shows was a whole different level. And there were some amazing experiences. But I mean, I was responsible for like for the front of house for Lollapalooza you know, at 20, not really having much production experience. And that was challenging, you know, if you don't really know exactly what you're doing. So they were uh, patient-ish. Trial by fire. Yeah, exactly. I imagine Stuart Ross is probably very gentle with you. (laughs) He seems like a very understanding man. Stuart there, yeah. Uh, Dan Choi uh, out in the front of house was awesome to work with. Kevin Lyman probably running the stage. Didn't work with Kevin on that, but that makes sense. And then, you know, some of those moments. So the production manager for the amphitheater, a guy named Chuck Kemp, used to play for the Lions. So he was uh, an offensive guard. He was a huge guy. So we're back there for, we'll leave the artist blank, but it was a sold out show. And the artist production manager didn't like catering that morning and was standing there and catering, grabbing plates off the catering line and smashing them until someone would come and fix his problem. So we get word that the production manager is crashing plates on the ground, smashing them to bits. And Chuck looks at me, Chuck's 6'6", 300 pounds. I'm 20. I weigh a buck 60. Wet. Wet. Yeah. He's like, zinc, go see what he wants. So I go back there and I'm scared to death. The guy's crashing plates. I don't know what the fuck to do. Just went in there and and did my best, took care of it. And from that point forward, that production manager was the nicest guy in the world. He realized, you know, I was going to go up and try to fix his problem, regardless of how crazy he was. Uh, You know, some good, a good early experience on, uh, you know, how to deal with an angry seemingly irrational person. They just want to be heard. Moving forward, maybe Chinette instead of uh, actual glass plates (laughs) and catering. (laughs) Before we move on, I know during that time frame, you got to do your first stadium show. (laughs) Speaking of trial by fire, and I think that's a fun story. Yeah. So Jimmy Buffett back in the day, uh, Nederlander did a ton with. So Cincinnati was one of those homes for Jimmy that six, seven nights in a row, that kind of thing. So we had the opportunity to do, you know, the new baseball stadium in Cleveland. It was Jacobs Field at that point. You know, they had been open not very long and this was going to be their first show. So Chuck and I, neither of us had ever done a stadium show before, got sent up there, kind of making it up as we went. And, you know, it was, uh, that was, a, that They're was not that hard. <laughs> you know, we show up and the, uh, the groundskeeper says, I hope all the grass dies and you guys are never welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, well, this is going to be an interesting week. Early days of passive aggressive right there. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, day before the show, city of Cleveland inspector comes out and asks for our building permits, which we, of course, didn't know we were supposed to get. Never doing a stadium show before. (laughs) So we're trying to send drawings back and forth. And, you know, the engineers are working on this together and it's just not going to happen in time. So the guy's like, well, you know, if you don't have a permit, I don't know that, you know, the show can't happen. And Chuck looks over him at him and he says, well, going to have 50,000 people here tomorrow. If you want to stand out front and tell them to go away, you can do that. But we're doing the show. <laughs> show happens. Uh, everything's great. Stage comes down. And uh, yeah, lo and behold, we killed most of the grass in the outfield, which was a problem for a couple of reasons. So Niederlander, I didn't know it at the time, owns, you know, a good chunk of the Yankees. So, uh, you know, when George Steinbrenner was suspended from baseball for a bit, it was one of the Niederlanders that took over. So I didn't know any of this. So I go to pick Robert Niederlander up at the airport. We're driving to the show. And I told him we were hoping for an all Ohio series. You know, I'm a Cincinnati (laughs) guy, Reds, Indians. It's going to be a big thing. And he was dead serious. He looked at me and said, you do not root for anybody but the Yankees. You're rooting for the Yankees to win the series. And he was dead serious. And I was scared to death. And someone explained to me later why that was a thing. I didn't know it was bad to root for my Reds. So anyway, the other fun thing. I know they're still your Reds. (laughs) So it was awesome. So I went to Miami of Ohio and a lot of my friends are from Cleveland or Indians fans. And, you know, we don't like the Indians or anyone from Cleveland. So Except Michael Belkin. <laughs> Except Michael Belkin. We love Michael. So it was nice to go, uh, go back to school that fall and you watch an ESPN and you look at uh, the, the Indians and you look at the brown outfield and I look at the, my friends and said, yeah, I did that. <laughs> 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 and I imagine now they just replaced the sod. Yeah. That show was the last show they did at Jacobs Field until, I mean, it was probably 20 years later. They finally had a country show or something out there. But they were that upset that their grass died that it was probably 20 years till the next show. So you're welcome. So you can produce stadium shows without <laughs> any knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> 
Don't recommend it, but you can do it. As long as you have helping you with production, someone that used to play for the Lions. Yes. He would get through a lot of issues that uh, mere mortals could not. Who wants to say no to that guy? (laughs) Exactly. Okay, so you're in the industry, you're working for Nederlander, you wind up in Denver somehow. Yeah, so I moved to Denver and uh, eventually found my way working for Mark Norman, who had just taken over the market from Barry Fay. So it was Universal Concerts at that point, which had purchased Barry's company, and Barry was there for a while and then and then retired. So yeah, working on Mark's desk, and Mark was responsible for a pretty wide area of, of states. Now, Barry Fay and Mark Norman, basically the same guy when you think <laughs> about it. Mark being a very methodical, thought-out thinker, like very calm, cool, collected character from Canada (laughs) and Barry being a loud Chicago Jew. Wait, where does that sound familiar? (laughs) Yeah, I loved working for Mark. That guy could, you know, generate some volume for sure, uh, especially for a Canadian. But, you know, he learned from Michael Cole. But yeah, Mark was a great person to work for and gave me a lot of of leeway. I think I had a lot of experience for, you know, someone that would be his assistant. Got to, you know, run around like he'd get the call from the agent and uh, we go work on, you know, arena dates in, you know, New Mexico or South Dakota, other parts of Colorado, et cetera. You know, really got to, you know, build the offers and, and really work on, you know, a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, so you started as an assistant for Mark and kind of work your way up very quickly there. Yeah, it was uh, his assistant for a little less than a year. Went down to be the general manager of the Paramount Theater, probably 25 at that point. Paramount Theater in Denver. Not to be confused with the other 98 of them. <laughs> Paramount in Denver, yeah. So managed that, and we did a lot of a lot of great shows there. And so that kind of went from you know me being kind of responsible for the theater to I wasn't wholly responsible for for booking all the dates by any stretch. Between Mark and and Jason Miller, who's in New York now, between those two guys, they booked you know most of those shows. So initially, my job was to fill in some some random shows here and there, whatever else could fill in the calendar. So you know things like uh, John Prine was one of the early ones that I picked up there that I still do to this day. And uh, there was a really a, an asshole local promoter named Dan Steinberg that I Bring used to. It. See, I just, I just want to throw out random insults at this point. Is that, is, right. that, is that acceptable? I will play back at you, so have fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there was this uh, scrappy young promoter there named Dan Steinberg. To be announced? Was that your company name then? To be announced presents. To be announced. The time Doug was nobody in particular, Jesse was guest. It was about having the cutesy names. Aha. Uh-huh. And we all fit together very well. <laughs> So yeah, that was those were the days of meeting you and working on some interesting shows at the Paramount and randomly going to like you know boxing matches and uh, hanging at the Ozit Lawn and and doing a number of stupid things. Well, that was actually an interesting time because Mark had left Denver and Barry had come out of retirement. So Jason Miller and Barry Fay running Denver together while you're in on the team. Yep, and Barry was brought in to bring in extra events, whether it's relationship things or create things. And part of that was boxing. Yeah. Barry brought boxing back to Denver. And we had a young fighter from here, Stevie Johnson, that was doing very well at the time and won a championship. And Magnus had just opened. Yeah, Magnus at the University of Denver, uh, which is, yeah, it was a great, uh, great building. So that was cool. Like, Barry did a lot of random stuff, you know, it was like, you know, big shows and all that kind of stuff. But boxing was was an interesting thing to work on. And that was fun to, you know, go to. Yeah, it was a fun night. I remember seeing the match and boxing had not come to Denver in years. So being in the arena and that feel of like what that was supposed to be like was super cool. Oh, that crowd was electric. Barry had a way of creating events, the Father Day concerts at the football stadium, not just like another concert, but making it an event. And that boxing match was an event. What I learned from Barry, you know, a lot of good and some bad, but uh, he had that P.T. Barnum spin, man. When that guy needed to sell tickets, he had a show that just needed to sell tickets. That guy could pull it out of his ass, man. He could work the media and figure it out. And that guy could sell tickets when he needed to. It wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, the approved marketing plan by the tour marketing company. It was, uh, I mean, this is that guy just getting out there and grinding and figuring out a way to get people to buy tickets. You know, the things that you learn from him of what not to do. (laughs) You know, like the legendary stories of Barry, you know, going bankrupt or telling us, he you know, go to... Uh, not in those days, but the old Faye days, you know, he would fly to Vegas for the weekend to try to make payroll. Things like that. Just, I mean, running and gunning, man, just, uh, you know, hard and fast. And those were, those were some crazy days. But man, that guy had stories for days. Amazing guy. And obviously that dichotomy of working for Barry and for Mark so close in between them. Yeah. Like the things you're going to learn off of those guys are completely different sets of skills and figuring out which ones you like best and maybe having 
maybe a little bit more of Mark Norman reaction to people while you're dealing with them <laughs> may get you a little further, but maybe a little of that P.T. Barnum berry face spin when it comes to selling tickets when you're in trouble. It's got to come in handy. Definitely. And I think that's, you know, true of anybody in life. There's so many people out there you can learn from. The way they do something is not necessarily the way you're going to do something, but you can pick up something. You can pick up something from everybody. And even if that's what not to do. Especially if it's what not to do. Most definitely. <laughs> okay. So you're... At the Paramount, and then you're moving up in the world. There's bigger venues calling your name. Yeah, I moved to Portland to open uh, the amphitheater that was across the way in uh, Washington State, actually, Ridgefield, Washington. So I went up there to open an 18,000-seat amphitheater and had a great time up there. Didn't last the summer. You know, that was an ugly experience. Moved at that point to Nashville and uh, went to work for Outback Concerts. At that time, Outback was kind of firing on all cylinders. They were doing all the blue-collar guys who were never really bigger than that at that moment of that couple of like next three years in that window, five years, whatever it was. Allison Krauss down the mountain like moment was it was yeah that all, all that, all, right that all came. I was probably I was probably employee number six there. Yeah, the, other than Jeff Foxworthy, no one else at that point had really broken. Like, actually, I had done a Larry the Cable Guy show in Denver prior to it being an Outback thing. You got the Paramount? Yeah, and so I started doing some of that stuff. So when I went to Outback, yeah, I'd already had a relationship with uh, with Cable Guy. And some of those early days of, you know, running around the country with him were absolutely priceless. Actually, Denver was a good story. We had done the Paramount, uh, went down after the show down to Comedy Works. Dan is... Larry's real name, but Dan, we went down there and he wanted to, you know, give back to the club and he did a set that night and uh, we had been drinking all night and, uh, you know, club shuts down. Uh, we leave. It was me and uh, Lisa Martin. Yeah. She was awesome. But she was there and me, her and Dan go into a 7-Eleven that's a block or two away. Uh, we're in the back of the 7-Eleven hammered making, you know, microwave burritos and stuff. And uh, at that point, the 7-Eleven got held up at gunpoint. So there was a back door there, you know, so I popped open the microwave, got my burrito out and, uh, you know, we went out the back door. (laughs) So you stole the burrito? Essentially, yes, I stole the burrito and a a smart person would have just left it in there and not alerted the gunman, but I was fucking hungry. (laughs) (laughs) Did you go back the next day and pay for the burrito? (laughs) I'd like to say that I did, but I did not. I think the statute of limitations (laughs) is probably up on that, but uh, burrito thief. Okay. We'll take it. You literally saw the gun. It was a literal, actual hold up. Absolutely. And you stayed to get the burrito. (laughs) (laughs) It was a long night of drinking. That's, you know. Because that's clearly not a sober move. I have my priorities. (laughs) (laughs) Damn good burrito. (laughs) But Outback in those days was uh, was really fun. But yeah, it was, uh, as you said, all of the blue collar guys. So after, you know, Cable Guy was up and running, then Ron White, and we were still doing Bill Ingvall, but and then putting, you know, all four of them together and you know, running around with that on some bigger things. We've, you know, filmed a special for that. You said Allison Krauss down from the mountain. You know, there's a, you know, uh, a lot of stuff that was happening, bigger country stuff. But yeah, there was, you know, an awful lot of good friends from there that are all still doing really great in the business. Well, most of them aren't there anymore because people move on in the industry, but it's kind of murderer's row when you think back, right? So Darren Lashinsky was there, right? Yeah. Run the hallway for me. Yeah, sure. So, uh, and Darren was was there early on. So he was, you know, one of the original guys there. Brian Penix was there. Damian Griman was there doing a lot of comedy. He runs one of the biggest comedy labels in, in the country right now. Ian Atkins works with him there. He was there. Kendall Moffat was there. He does, you know, advertising or marketing at an NS2. Kevin. Kevin Brady. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, who still lives in Kalamazoo. He still runs around doing a lot of shows. George. Uh, George Salmers. Yep. Uh, Henry Glasscock, who was at William, an agent Crystal William Morris. Crystal Pistol. The Crystal Pistol in the house, for sure. A lot of talent buyers doing a lot of different things and a lot of volume. Clubs to arenas to what, amphitheater business. Like, they're kind of crushing it on all levels. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of big stuff, for sure. A lot of those, you know, the, a lot of the blue-collar guys were doing arena stuff. Uh, I was running around with Dirk Bentley all over the country at that point. Brad Garrett at Police Productions was our partner on that. And so Brad and I ran around with Dirks and, you know, that was graduating him from clubs to, to small arenas. And we went everywhere with that. Now, Brad had an interesting model and you guys did a lot of business and he was kind of exploding when Outback was exploding. But he had a different model than, say, us or Outback, where he's like, he really focused on the act and did as many dates as he could and kind of put all his eggs in the basket. So there, was, there wasn't a ton of different artists but it really seemed like back then there was a moment for him where it was like he had 
Martina Pride was exploding and he was messing with some Van Halen dates. And there mm-hmm. was like a moment where it's thought that maybe it could go. It was thought at that point that, you know, an independent could hang on to that act that you grew into the arenas. You know, it's sort of right in those years when Brian O'Connell goes in at, at Live Nation and really starts building that Live Nation touring country model that exists today. And he did that by, you know, he just went out and made uh, made all these great deals with all these artists and got really close. So, Which helps if you have the amphitheaters and festivals <laughs> that he's built up over time. So you can't exactly compete with it because they don't exactly exist for anyone else. Yes, exactly. So, you know, those large, large dollar amphitheater shows help to pay them more than we could afford to pay them in the arenas. So there was that moment where we had gone and built Jason Aldean all over the country and we'd built Luke Bryan and we'd built Brad Paisley and we had built all these acts and they all left and they all went somewhere else. And it was, uh, you know, got a little demoralizing after a while when you when you see uh, a lot of your hard work leave like that. And, you know, not faulting the artists there, you know, following money and following their career. And, you know, that was that's their decision. And that's OK. But uh, some of those guys were, were nice over the years and, and threw threw us some bones back. So while it might have been a, a Live Nation tour, Dirks came back and gave us some dates. Luke Bryan came back and gave us some arena dates. And, you know, uh, while the artist is gone for the most part, it doesn't have to all be gone. They can still be cool and, and throw a date back. Brad has kind of since then kind of gone a different direction. We haven't seen a lot of volume out of him in the same way. It seems like yeah, he kind of ran into that same wall where it was like building the artist and then all of a sudden they're gone and kind of found a different picking and choosing and cherry picking yeah, in a different lane. Brad, yeah, Brad wants to be all, all or nothing for the most part. I don't want to speak for him, but all or nothing for the most part. Part. And like Miranda Lambert, you know, he had a lock on. It was all good. And he had, was doing that all over the country. And then he lost that. And then he was small enough company, spent so much time doing that, that it's sort Cover of hard. Was bared. To, yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's hard to start over then. Because you, you start over on the on, on a small act and there's no money. Plate spinning contest where you're trying to keep them all going simultaneously, <laughs> hoping nothing falls. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like we now have, you know, a similar model of trying to work with a lot of the same artists all over the place and run around with them. But we've diversified that enough that, you know, losing one of them is not going to, you know, shut the doors. It's, uh, you know, we just, we, we go and find uh, find the next. But yeah, Brad, Brad was awesome. I always liked being the next show in, in an arena after Brad was there because they're terrified after that and they will say yes to anything like you don't have to do anything they just assume that you're going to be uh you know deal with them the same way that brad did which is just grind 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 grind. (laughs) exactly so it's uh that was always that was always my favorite it's an amazing way of working with people everybody's got their own vibe and their own thing but brad's a great promoter you learned how to route tours and build them and produce arena tours while you were at outback because you guys were doing you you were doing regional stuff when you were in colorado but it grew into the whole country when you were focusing on x at outback and you had just room of the entire map just go wherever you can yeah and, and really tried to be a student you know looking at the maps with all those guys but also looking at the ticket counts from all over the country there are you know markets like saint joe missouri i didn't know existed that suddenly you know we were like for cable guy we were doing like two arena shows there which makes no sense at all cape Girardeau and missouri and you know burlington iowa and all of these random places i didn't know existed so that was really a geography lesson and also a lesson on what kind of shows work there even if it wasn't something that I was working on, I paid attention to everything. So those days of like, you know, I was going around the country with Old Crow Medicine Show and Yonder Mountain String Band and a lot of like theater and club acts and simultaneously doing dirks in the arenas. So my typical week was, you know, I would work in the office uh, Monday through Wednesday. Wednesday night, I would get on the bus with Dirks' crew. You know, one of those nights, like a Dirks Miranda tour, I would you know, rode on Miranda's bus most of that tour, but we would do that. So I would book the dates. Uh, I was also the production manager and promoter rep. I was the only person there from the company. So, you know, 7 a.m., uh, I'm in there. We're, you know, getting ready for rigging and setting up breakfast and marking off the floor. Yep. And yeah, I would go out and do that. And uh, I would be there, you know, in the venue from 7 or 8 a.m. until midnight or 1. Um, you get on the bus, you wake up the next morning, you do the whole thing over. Uh, we get back on, you know, Sunday afternoon or Sunday night. And I get up on Monday morning, go to the office. And we did that most of the year. <laughs> it drove me nuts when we started partnering together because I was trying to talk you into staying in the office and working more and not going on the road. But you were so ingrained with you. It was like, no, I need to do this. This is, this is part of promoting shows. I'm like, really? This is the, this is the one thing you should be giving up and, and delegating. <laughs> Your time is better spent at the office. Let's let's pay the guy to cover the show. I need you at a desk. Please. I came from a different direction and you were definitely right. I was I was much more productive, but I came from that point of view of I wanted to be there with the artist and the crew all day and have those 
experiences and trade. And, and a lot of that is completely invaluable. But should a production manager have been doing that? And should I have been booking or marketing instead? Yeah, I should have been. Now, in all <laughs> fairness, there were things that you implemented that I picked up that I never wanted to give up, like marketing and accounting. I wanted to market every show. <laughs> and you're like, this is ridiculous. Like, cut the deals. Let somebody market the fucking shows. Like, no, no, no. Nobody can market as good as I can. So there was a lot of that give and take. Exactly. You and I both had to figure out, uh, you know, I, I adopted a lot of your style. You adopted a very small amount of my style. I eat hot chicken. It was <laughs> it was us and a few people originally. I mean, when I started Sherpa, originally I was the only person. So that was marketing the show, booking the show, doing production on the show, accounting for the show. I always have the opinion in, in, in the business, take every single job you can, learn everything. And it didn't really make sense at, the, at first, but at some point, you know, when you start running your own company, it's like, it's helpful to realize how to do all these jobs and be able to help people do their jobs because you've done it before. So we, we skipped a step. So let's go back. Yeah. So while you were out back, you created a bunch of relationships, Yonder Mountain, Umphreys and McGee. You were running all over the country doing a bunch of different things, a lot of jam, a lot of Americana, a lot of country, and really just by volume, building some amazing relationships and really getting your chops on marketing and production and buying shows on all levels really hammered in. But Outback sold the jam mm -hmm. and changed the ethos of the office. Mm -hmm. They were just, it's a different system and things were changed. So you had called me one morning and said, I've got a meeting in an hour. I'm not sure how this ends, but I may be an independent promoter in an hour and may need some help. <laughs> and I was like, we'd already been partnering a good number of shows. I had introduced you to the world of PBS through acapella. Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. Acapella did this. <laughs> <laughs> Still applies every day. <laughs> A couple hours later, you call me back and you're like, okay, well, that meeting went as bad as could be. And I'm now, I'm now an independent promoter. I'm going to need some help. Yeah. Fortunately, a lot of those relationships that we had built over the years, you know, a lot of people that wanted to be on our side and help. And so we had a lot of people that, that really looked after us early on and gave us a lot of great shows. Jay Williams and Scott Kernahan and Aaron Pincus, a lot of people, you know, really took good care of us. So there were a lot of great shows that were coming our way, but money was definitely a real thing early on. I think I started the company with 15 grand. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 15 grand and a credit card. And I think I had a $15,000 credit limit at that point. So, I mean, early on, my first show was uh, July 4, Yonder Mountain String Band show at, at an outdoor venue in, in Cincinnati. And it was scheduled to not just rain, but rain the entire day. And, you know, for those guys back in those days, I mean, it was, you know, doing thousand person walk-ups. Yeah, that was common. Was normal. Especially so, outside. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, at a $25 ticket, having those thousand people or not is all the difference in the world. So I think we had 500 tickets that were pre-sold for that, you know, and I got to sell probably 1100 to get out of that. And I really needed to sell them. And, you know, people knowing they were going to stand in the rain, we still walked up like 900 people. And the difference in that to me was everything. And I had a, a series of those. Old Crow Medicine Show was another one of those. So there was a show that did, it was Dirks and Miranda in like Salisbury, Maryland. And the next day was in West Virginia. All the buses were full. And so I rode on the production truck <laughs> from show to show. And so there wasn't any room. I put my bag, my computer bag in the back. And on the way there, it was really, really bumpy. You're going through the mountains. So my computer screen had broken. So you could see about maybe half of the screen. The other half is black. This is when I'm at Outback still. And I uh, ended up getting a new computer and just the other one was broken. It went into a desk. Never thought about it again. Leave Outback, put my, give my computer back to them. And I still have this old one. So for the first, I don't know, six months at least, I'm using this computer that you can't see on. When I'm in the office, I have an external monitor and it's not as noticeable. When I'm on the road, literally, you're pulling the Excel sheet over to the other <laughs> half of the screen so that I could type into it. I just, I was scared to spend the money. So we had an old crow show in Huntington, West Virginia. It was along the river, outdoor show. And uh, I, it was another one of those. I needed about 1,200 people to walk up. And it rained on the other side of the river from the venue for most of the show. But the side that the show was on didn't rain at all. And we walked up like 1,500 people. And uh, it was after that show, I decided I had enough money that I could buy a laptop that had a whole screen. <laughs> Moving into the big time. 
So in those days, you know, so some of those shows were straight up Sherpa. There are a lot of them that were Sherpa and Square Peg, and I, I, I relied on you quite a bit for a lot of the infrastructure of a lot of our shows. But we had a, what, what originally I think we, we referred to as an airline partnership, where if a show was on the eastern half of the country, it was it was a Sherpa show. If it was on the other half, it was a Square Peg show, and uh, we had pockets that sort of dug in and out. But we figured out. Our co-promote system. Right. And we basically had that with the union in Canada, too, where right, we would, right. if we were going over the border, we'd hand the show off to Harvey, and it would be the same thing if they had the show coming in the States. So and this nice little triangle. Uh, you and I did so much business, and there was such a trust factor. The Where it started to get interesting was one of us would call the other one at a show doing a settlement going, hey, did we do this show together or did we not? I remember asking you that one time, and your answer was, did the show make money? <laughs> But we doing so much business together, we literally couldn't remember what was a co-promote and what. Well, wasn't. there's so much of it was was on the phone that there wasn't an email trail and everything. <laughs> right. I remember doing a handful of Alfie Bow dates for Andrea, and I remember some of them were co-promotes and some of them weren't, and I couldn't remember for the life of me. And either could you, and you're just like, whatever, spare. Let's just like whatever. <laughs> So we're doing several hundred shows a year together and decide, okay, we can't remember which market is which on some of this stuff and finally throw it out the window. It's like, all right, just everything goes in the pot after this, whatever day it was. We decided start anything that confirms after this day moving forward. It's just a co-promote bucket. Yeah. And then, you know, trying to figure out, because we were sharing staff too. So we had actually hired a marketing director together and we were trying to figure out how to apportion that to shows. I don't remember trying to do that. I don't know that we ever still figured that out. I think they decided that was future Dan and Jason's problem to figure out. And still is. Which, by the way, is our favorite thing. We don't have to deal with that now. Future Dan and Jason will deal with that. Love those guys. Yeah, those guys are going to be those busy. Those guys are awesome. Yeah. They want to handle this. They'll do it much more like pros. <laughs> everything was a co-promote, and we were partnering, sta- we were sharing staff, co-promoting everything, running as one company, but still doing everything under two FINs and technically two companies, which yeah. the genius for that was we got to each have a ticketing company exclusive. <laughs> we did do that. You had a Ticketmaster contract. I had a Ticketfly contract. And somehow, whichever one was the better deal for that show happened to be one of us. The, the other the one had the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Did, did we just say that out loud? It's all right. Andrew Druskin sold his company <laughs> yeah. twice since then and has now retired the second time. It's fine. And we're with the other company. Apparently, they won. Perfect. Or they bought us. So whatever. <laughs> we won. <laughs> So yeah, if you have two uh, two different companies, you can have two different exclusives. Yeah, and after a while, I think we we had we had made the decision we were going to be one company. We we couldn't agree on a name. It, it was more important to keep doing good business than it was to stop the presses and figure out a name. And then uh, yeah, at some point, we'd come up with a bunch of really really bad names. We did, and and other people helped us with those. I think Paul Lore came up with Zinkenstein concerts. I think you bought the, the website. URL. Yeah, <laughs> we got that. Paul insisted upon it. I don't think that was ever taken seriously by either of us, but there were some really yeah. good Jew and German jokes in there too that probably wouldn't have gone over well. No, no, they were funny though. Well, it does. Yeah, and then finally, yeah, you. I think we were actually looking at buying a venue. Uh, it was a club, and uh, you threw out the Emporium name. We didn't end up buying that club, but we were like, huh. That actually kind of works. Yeah, I always wanted to do shows at the Emporium. And I think that's where it came from. It was like, we could do shows in that market and promote them under Emporium Presents. And you're like, oh, shit, that's it. I'm like, you want to open a club? You're like, well, yeah, at some point, but Emporium Presents. <laughs> that's our like, name. Check to see if the URL zone, because I think we were driving back from Pueblo or something. And, oh, yes. and I was like jumping on GoDaddy to see. If, <laughs> Dude, it's, it's available. <laughs> and there it is. I still like the name. I like the name, too. <laughs> Okay, so you'd moved around the country. You'd wound up leaving Nashville and coming back to Colorado. Yeah, for no no business reason. Just, you know, enjoy Colorado. And I love Nashville. I, I, you know, could see myself living there again someday. You know, still still go back there fairly often. But yeah, Colorado is a wonderful place to live. Uh, live, you know, on the side of a mountain here and the bears and the mountain lions and everything else. And um, the offices in Golden. And um, yeah, we enjoy our time out here. But there's, we're up to, you know, I was just one person out here. I think there's, what, uh, 11 or 12 of us now. Okay, so you're a mountain man. You're back in Colorado with a family. You have an office here, lots of shows, and you're you're kind of focusing on country and Americana. Am I? I don't know. <laughs> 
Seems like it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we certainly do a lot of country, a lot of Americana. Um, just some of those uh, things that uh, just always kind of loved. It's nice to do, you know, stuff that you have a personal connection to, which is not everything that we do, certainly. You know, we're most promoters, but, you know, I think as opposed to what you personally are into, it's 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 cool to watch the bond that occurs between the uh, the artist and the audience, you know, w- uh, whatever genre that is. And, 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 and I, I don't know, I always really appreciate, you know, trying to create that connection. And if you've created that connection, then, you know, things tend to work out. A lot of promoters stick to one market, see the act once every 18 months, two years, once an album cycle, give or take. Maybe they get lucky in the out- band plays twice in a cycle. You see the band three to 60 times an album cycle, sometimes more. Is that an advantage for you or is it, would it be easier if you had a calendar and you were booking a club? I, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages each way. I, I, I have always preferred, you know, once I learned the, you know, more of the touring model and, you know, it's more fun and more re- rewarding to me to be a part of the, the, the artist team and help them get to their goal. So if early on we're looking at, you know, what markets to play and you're strategizing with them on, you know, when the album drops and, you know, marketing surrounding that and working with the record label and really being part of the process, that's pretty rewarding. Or, you know, talking about, you know, what our goal is this time in a market with an artist and what our goal is next time in, in a market. It's, it's so much more rewarding to be part of that team and help help everybody get along. And, you know, I definitely subscribe to the theory that uh, as we talk about, it's a, it's a service business and uh, our job is to help the artists get where they want to go. Do a good job, uh, you know, bringing the audience in and taking care of them and making sure everybody has a good time and take care of the artist and take care of the crowd and everything else will take care of itself. So while when you're routing a tour, it might not be, hey, we're going to make the most money in this building, but, you know, what's the right play? what's the right play for the artist in this market? And we always focus on what's the right play for the artist. And at the end of the day or at the end of the tour, the artist trusts you to do the right thing as opposed to the, maybe the thing that might be more financially advantageous that day for you. So fair to say you're a detail guy? Yeah, you kind of have to be. Not to the degree that you are, fucking crazy person. <laughs> I would argue that you're more of a detail person than I am. <laughs> I don't know that I would. I would not say that I'm OCD. I didn't say you were OCD. <laughs> by, by saying that I wasn't, I was saying you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fucking fair. Um, but, but you get really granular on the details. Like you catch way more stuff than I do because I tend to go faster and move quicker. And you tend to be really good about catching things that I wouldn't or most people wouldn't. Yeah, you you move extremely fast. I might move, uh, move a little slower. But yeah, different styles for sure. I enjoy walking through a venue with you and, and you sing the line and how slow they're getting people in because you're like in your head you're seeing the dollars go away for what should be in the bank that's a painful thing i I, it's absolutely awful for me um so i used to manage venues and you know used to also you know work on production crew look at both of those things real differently than maybe a normal person does but yeah when i see you know huge lines outside of a gate to to let people in because someone didn't want to spend an extra few hundred dollars on more ticket takers. It's aggravating because they're losing all of that money at the bar. If they're standing in that line, they're not in line at the bar and or at merch or wherever. The mismanagement of, of, of events like that is just painful to watch. So um, when you go to a show, even if it's not your show, it's awful because your brain just keeps working. So the only way I can actually enjoy being at a show that I'm uh, not working at is just to get absolutely hammered. And you think about it a lot less. <laughs> You're going show from show, venue to venue. You see how people do business differently. And as a promoter, you have to adapt between how the act wants to work, how the venue works, because they tend to be a little less flexible. And you try to like... Well, it's fine, fine to have you meet him. Yeah, there are, you know, there are certain things that absolutely need to happen. And some of the rest of that you know, can be just semantics. But certain venues work certain ways. And uh, either, you know, you can have that conversation and, and do it a different way, or you just try to be flexible. And as long as, I don't know, generally, as long as our overall mission is being accomplished, all of those venue idiosyncrasies, you just kind of go with. Everybody seems to believe that the way they do business is how everybody does business across all forms. And it's like, this is the way business is done. And since we get to work with all these different venues and all these different acts, and you get to learn that best common practices aren't necessarily the same thing as how people think business is done across the board. Yeah. I think, you know, it's nice to, I think for us to have that vantage point of all these different ways that uh, our business can be done. And we've stolen ideas from everybody. Oh, yeah, some, sometimes they're genius. <laughs> it's like, how did we not see that? Yeah. It's suddenly obvious. We're doing that for every exactly. show. 
Or how do you think that that is practical? And have you been doing that for every show? <laughs> but every time we go to a market and, uh, you know, love to get as many shows as we can, but every time we go to a market or talk to a new market, you know, it's, an, it's a learning opportunity. Talking to the radio station or the venue or whatever, talking about what works in that market and why does it work in that market. Some really interesting knowledge you get from people just by asking the questions and trying to be a student. What do you think the biggest changes between being an independent promoter and now working for one of the biggest promoters in the world? Accounting. <laughs> Truly, is that the biggest change in your mind? You know, I think that was probably the biggest one for us, you know, in, initially, just in, in terms of, you know, the nuts and bolts operation. But uh, I think for me, what it's done is, you know, really broadened horizons upon what is possible. You know, we did a really heavy theater business, some clubs and, and, and some arenas. But, um, you know, it's nice now to have that thought that, you know, you can start with an artist in the clubs and take them to arenas and stadiums. Like we absolutely can do that. You know, financially before, while we did a lot of business, you know, we couldn't run around doing, you know, five stadium or five arena tours at a time. We just financially, it wasn't possible. Well, now it is. Not to say that we're immediately doing that. We like to build into that, but it's 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 at least nice to have that option to think about things in those terms. And um, when you want to make an investment in an artist, and by, you know, going out and running around all over the place where you're, you know, trying to break even sometimes, you can do that in the knowledge that if it really does work and if you are right and that artist is working hard and building, the end result can be big. In your head, do you still see yourself as an independent? Yeah, I think, you know, Live Nation for the most part, you know, seems like they've, uh, you know, they said you guys make money. Um, go do what you do. And they like what we do generally, but I don't, you know, they're not micromanaging by any stretch. You know, if we want to go do a show, we go do a show. Been some of, if we want it to be business as usual, it can be. Um, but I got to tell you, it's been been really cool to take advantage of a lot of the knowledge and a lot of these amazing promoters that are at Live Nation. Um, when we originally looked at, you know, what kind of a deal we would do with what company, um, you realized all the people at Live Nation that were, you know, really good people uh, we're like well shit there's a lot of our friends that are over here you know so it's nice to be able to tap in and do shows with those guys where before we just weren't i mean we you know very consciously tried to work outside the system um so it's nice to have all of that knowledge of outside the system and now integrating that into the system and that seems to be working well for everybody i mean i think the artist is likes the artists that like working with us and likes working with the way that we work um, like us going and doing more of the dates. So that's been a win for a lot of those folks and having access to a lot of those venues and working with a lot of those amazing people has been a huge win for the artist and, and win for us. So when you're building a relationship with the act, it's all about the actual personalities clicking and actually finding people that you want to work with long term because going from one show to six shows to 20 shows has to do with people legitimately just wanting to work with you. It's very rare where it's just like your deals are just so much better than everybody else's because there's a lot of you know, this is what things cost. Mm -hmm. You may work harder and you might whatever, but it's the click, right? It's how well you get along. How do you build those relationships? How do they come to be? Alcohol. The bar? <laughs> no, I think, uh, yeah, you're right to agree. You know, like the money is important. The money always has to be taken care of. And that's always going to be a, a, a very large component of the process. But yeah, if you are buddies and, you know, you truly want to spend time, acts that we work with when it's, it's great when you go and it's like a family reunion and everybody wants to say hi and talk and, you know, talk about kids or uh, other shows you've seen, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you can't really force. That's born out of, uh, you know, an off night in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, where you, you know, you all went out to dinner or you did something like that. Yeah, I agree. It's just a matter of clicking and, and truly just wanting to, to hang out. And if you can have that in addition to all of the financial wherewithal, which is, is imperative, then, you know, then it's a win. Best thing that can happen is you work with your friends. What's the future, the way you see it? What are you working toward? What are the goals? Goals for the business is taking the uh, a lot of the relationships that we have and that are really fun for us and, you know, with Live Nation's help, moving a lot of those to the next level and those new relationships that are developing, being able to one-up the business and the job that we could do previously. What are you currently listening to? What's the stuff that gets you excited when you turn on Spotify? This, I, I wouldn't say that it's a Spotify week for me. This week has actually been... I went to see the dead in Boulder uh, last Saturday and uh, it's it's bizarre I uh, I didn't it wasn't like listening to a ton of it before that uh, but the serious Grateful Dead channel has been 24/7 for me since then. this when you can discover new music <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, not new music by any stretch, but uh, that's more in the in the category of uh, when you hear that, it's like going to see an old friend, and it's just it it just feels good. Any advice on career longevity? Learn how to do everything. It's actually not bad advice. <laughs> All right. Well, I thought this was going to be an awkward interview, but it was actually a lot of fun. <laughs> now we drink? Now we drink. <laughs> Promoter 101 with Jason Zink. Dan, that's clearly a special bond between you and Jason. There must be 20 years of friendship there. I'm glad we got a business like this. Uh, it's fun that we finally got to get Jason on the podcast. It seems like we couldn't bring it to an end without actually picking on him a little bit here. Mark Campana. I'm with Live Nation Concerts, and I'm on Promoter 101. The quote of the week comes to us from Richard Bach. The more I want to get something done, the less I call it work. It's pretty deep. This is Christine Marshall from CAA, and you're listening to Promoter 101. This concludes our broadcast day. But you can write to us, of course, at steiny at promoter101.net. And if you miss anything, you can catch up. We'll return this Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I thought that was midnight Greenwich time, but I learned yesterday that the time change, it's 1 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Incredibly confusing. Ask APA Steve Ferguson, who we're interviewing. He might know the answer. Until then, we're wishing you sold out shows for the weeks to come. Cheers. Call your mother, or as like we say in the UK, call your mum. This is Greg Schmalley from Access Ticketing, and you're listening to Promoter 101. Ooh. Ba-da-ba-ba. Ooh.